Welcome back. Well, we certainly had a very interesting day today in the markets. Uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics this morning reported the CPI, Consumer Price Index, rose 8.3% in August. That's year over year, 0.1% uh, uh, hike over the past uh, month. The core CPI that excludes more volatile components, uh, including food and energy, that rose 0.6%. Uh, this increase in CPI did beat expectations, uh, and the cost increases were led uh, by increases in food, shelter, medical services, and of course we know that fuel uh, prices did fall over the past month. So really, uh, it was a big surprise to the upside um, that most did not expect. And the reason why this is so significant, you know, the number itself doesn't look like such a big deal, but it all leads us to the question whether the Federal Reserve uh, will raise interest rates. Uh, certainly, it's a certainty that it, that they will. The expectation now, the Fed fund futures actually is predicting uh, a chance that the F that the Federal Reserve will raise interest rates by one percent next meeting, and not only zero point seven five percent. Now, the CPI over here we see rose uh, just a small degree, but certainly beating expectations, uh, and the trend continues higher. If you remember last month, the CPI. Uh, was flat and the question was well maybe this the Federal Reserve this is, gives them enough reason to pull back a little bit on the reins that's not the case though uh, full speed ahead as far as most analysts are concerned now the CPI here we can see again last month it was a tepid reading uh, leading some traders and analysts to believe that the Federal Reserve would pull back a little bit not the case though full steam ahead uh, with the expectation of higher interest rates now year over year again uh, reporting for this month, 8.3% rise, uh, and certainly 8% in one year for inflation. That's a big number, and we continue to climb higher. Now, as far as looking at the statistics, this is the highest CPI we've seen, at least going back over the past 10 months, and you know certainly longer than that, uh, registering the highest high we've seen in quite a long time. Interesting enough, there are several correlations that exist between the CPI, which is over here, and many different numbers. A lot of them will be reported this week. So later on this week, we have the advanced retail sales that has a 95% correlation with CPI, at least over the near term, the, the recent uh, uh, history. Also, capacity utilization, that will be reported later on this week. It's a very strong correlation. That could be positive news. Uh, but we are also expecting University of Michigan numbers to come out later on this week. There's an 89% negative correlation. When inflation goes up, University of Michigan confidence tends to go down. Uh, in addition to that, we have the PPI, which is really the big number that we're looking for later on as well. Producer price index, 97% positive correlation. When CPI goes up, PPI goes up and vice versa. So uh, I think that the market is really expecting the producer price index to go up as well. We have New York Empire manufacturing figures coming out later this week. There's a strong negative correlation. Manufacturing tends to go down when the cost goes up. And then we have the Philly, the Philly manufacturing outlook, 79% negative correlation. We certainly expect that to fall as well based at least on today's positive CPI number. Well, the increase is not really a positive, but the increase in CPI. Now, take a look at the CPI versus the PPI. CPI are the blue histogram bars as we go up, so does the PPI. And again, last month, the CPI and PPI were a little bit tepid, but based on today's number, we may expect the PPI to go up as well. Uh, it'll be very interesting to see. Here's a New York Empire Manufacturing negative correlation when CPI goes up the New York Empire numbers go down same holds true for Philly manufacturing as well so uh, certainly it'll be very interesting to see how this plays out but ultimately the question is what will the Federal Reserve do in the next meeting this is a quick look at the S&P 500 big day to the downside uh, over 12 1300 points to the downside at one point we can see the uh, S&P 500 below the blue line, that's a 20 simple moving average, piercing below the lower Bollinger Band, but really this is just the beginning. Uh, the VIX, the volatility index, certainly has not registered uh, a, a catastrophic level yet. We're only, I believe, around a 30 level. 
Take a look at the S&P 500 in terms of their components. Top left-hand chart, every one of these dots represents one stock in the S&P 500 uh, based on their own respective RSI relative strength index. So we can see the vast majority of the stocks have an RSI between 35 to 55. Uh, to the right-hand side, we can see this with a bit more detail. We can see that 136 stocks have, a, have an RSI between 45 and 50. Again, readings below 50 are considered weak, readings above 50 are considered strong, but we're not really oversold until the RSI on a particular stock or a market drops below 30. We're not there yet. We only have eight stocks with an RSI around 30. The vast majority of the stocks we can see here uh, have an RSI uh, between 40 and 45, that's 85 stocks. We have, uh, again, another 136 stocks, I believe, between with an RSI of 45 to 50. You know, over 100 stocks with an RSI around 50 to 55. So we're still really not very oversold yet. Bottom left-hand chart shows us the S&P 500 in terms of their individual components based on their own 52-week ranges. Uh, the brunt of the stocks are near the lower end of the range between, let's say, the 15 to 45 area. Graphically on the right side, we can see uh, the highest histogram bar indicates that we have 52 stocks that are in the 15 to 20 percentile range of their 52-week range. So imagine if you have a, a stock with a range, a 52-week range of one to $100 a share, 52 stocks would be priced around $15 a share. Um, and we have you know, another 48 stocks around 20% of their 52-week range. Point being is that we're very close to the lower end of the 52-week range. Definitely most of the stocks are below the 50% level, near the lower end of the range. But again, the RSI is telling us we're not really at a point of capitulation yet. As ugly as the equity markets were today, we could certainly go a lot lower than that. Take a look at how this breaks down in terms of the individual indices. Now this is the S&P 500, we break it down in terms of sectors and their respective ETFs. The strongest sector by far, the 10-year Treasury Index. We're gonna take a look at bonds in a moment. Volatility index is number two, that's the VIX, but certainly not overbought. The VIX only has an RSI of 60. Readings above 70 are considered to be overbought. We're not there yet. More interesting, look at the bottom end. The weakest sectors, NASDAQ, semiconductors, uh, consumer staples, more consumer staples, uh, select Spiders Trust, that's a technology trust, Dow Jones Industrial Average. So we see you know, a broad-based sell-off led by technology, some staples to the downside. Interestingly enough, gold is not near the lower end of the range. Now, gold we would expect to go down under this light of uncertainty. However, gold tends to go up when we see the dollar go down. We're gonna take a look at the FX mark in a moment. The dollar's not going down. In fact, the dollar's going up. Why? Because the anticipation is based on inflation, the Federal Reserve is gonna raise rates. We're not gonna see the dollar reverse course back to the downside until the market, all of us perceive that the Federal Reserve is not gonna raise interest rates anymore. So far, uh, there's a very, very strong chance of at least a 75 basis point hike. Now, right chart, right hand side of the chart, we have the, the same sectors, but broken down in terms of their own 52 week ranges. The 10 year treasury index is right near the high, and we're gonna see the 10 year bond is definitely offering a lower yield than some of the other shorter term bonds. But we're 97% up to its 52 week range. If the 52 week range was one to $100, the 10-year treasury would be around $97. Right behind that, uh, the utility index, several utility indices actually, and then energy. The bottom end in terms of the 52-week range, what's trading right near the lower end of the range? Telecommunications, gold, uh, technology, gold and silver again. Interestingly enough, the gold sectors are near the lower end of the ranges, but as far as the 52-week range is concerned, but they're not near the lower end of the ranges in terms of their RSI, the relative strength. 
Gold is not selling off hard. I think a lot of traders probably anticipate down the road, gold is gonna be a good buy. So uh, I think that they're not selling this very aggressively. In terms of the FX market, uh, number three, in terms of the strongest currencies with their individual RSI is the U.S. dollar with an RSI of 57. Above that is a Swiss franc. Interestingly enough, very strong correlation between the Swiss franc and gold. And then the Thai bots, number one. Bottom end of the chart, this hasn't changed at all. The Turkish lira is the weakest currency, followed by the Japanese yen. I would expect, however, though, that if we see equity markets continue to go down and those higher yielding currencies go down, we may see traders step in and buy the low uh, yielding Japanese yen as a flight to safety. But take a look to see the biggest movers in the FX markets. The biggest move to the upside, this is just the daily change in RSI, is the US dollar. U.S. dollar goes up in anticipation of higher interest rates. We have a 57 RSI in the U.S. dollar. Yesterday, it was 51. Uh, Japanese yen, like we just said, is a hard side of 33, but we came off of lows of 29. So there is a little bit of buying in the Japanese yen uh, based in part maybe on the anticipation that equity markets are going to continue lower. The most interesting story in uh, equity markets or in financial markets overall, I would say, is the bond markets. We've seen 15-year highs on, I believe, the one-year bond. So take a look at, we have the 30-year bond pays a 3.51% yield, the 20-year bond, 375, the 10-year bond at a 342. But we see the one-year bond has a 392 yield. This inversion really has steepened. Take a look at the, the comparison, the one-year bond to the 10-year bond, a 50 basis point inversion, meaning that the one-year bond pays half a percent, which is actually a huge number, a half a percent difference between the one-year bond and the 10-year bond in favor of the one-year bond. Now, as we know, there's, there's an inverse relationship. When bond yields go up, the bond prices are actually going down. So that one-year bond at a 392, that's actually telling us that traders in the market are selling all the short-term bonds. They're selling the one-year bonds. The near-term outlook, based on at least today's action, is very bleak. Traders don't want to own very short-term bonds. They're moving the money into the 10-year bond. Maybe that's why the 10-year bond treasury index, uh, you know, we saw on the indices, is the number one performing ETF all the way on the left-hand side over here in terms of the relative strength and 52-week range. Capital is flowing into uh, the 10-year bond and flowing out of these short-term bonds. Top right-hand side, the red line represents total bond yields. This almost vertical spike up, that's today. That accelerated very much. Now, if you recall, last week we spoke, we saw as total yields. Now, the red line represents all yields of the bonds together. So the 30-year bond yield plus the 20-year plus a 10 all the way on down. That continues to rise. Last week we saw a, a really peculiar, unusual phenomenon where the stock market rallied and the bond yields rallied. Well, that didn't make sense. We usually see an inverse relationship, at least based on what we're looking at now, meaning the stock market's going down in fear of a Federal Reserve hike. Well, the Federal Reserve hike and the anticipation of that is driving bond yields higher. Well, we would expect when the red line goes up, the blue line to go down. Last week, we said, this doesn't make sense. Stocks are strong while yields continue to go up. Well, today, and we said, well, maybe this, this divergence this disagreement in markets presents an opportunity. Well, for those traders that were either ready to sell the stocks down here, that was the opportunity. Or to sell bonds betting on higher yields, that was also the opportunity. Kind of like an arbitrage. If you expect, and this does not always holds true. This is based on the current economic situation. If we expect yields to go higher, we expect stocks to go lower. And now everyone is watching the economic calendar, CPI today, PPI later on this week. If that continues to show more and more inflation, giving the Federal Reserve more and more reason to raise interest rates, I think it gives traders more and more reason to sell stocks. So uh, with that said, we have some pretty interesting correlations here. The strongest correlation by far 
is the 30-20 spread. This is the difference between the 30-year bond and the 20-year bond. Now there's an inversion. The 30-year bond pays a 351, the 20-year bond pays a 375. It's a negative 0.24% inversion, meaning that as uh, the stock market goes down, the S&P 500 goes down, we tend to see uh, an acceleration in this inversion. The capital is moving more into the 20 than the 30 year. Graphically speaking, this is what it looks like. Here, let's switch over to the 30, 20 spread. That's the orange line. And then the black line is the S&P 500. When the spread increases, the S&P 500 goes up. When the spread decreases, the S&P 500 goes down. Pretty strong correlation over here. Interesting also, an inverse correlation to the same degree also occurs or is uh, occurring between the one year and six month spread. That means that when the stock market goes down, the inversion is reversing on the one year, six month spread. So again, black line, S&P 500, uh, and this other grayish line is the difference between the one year and six month spread. Uh, most interesting by far. The orange area chart is the S&P 500. We, we came down very, very strongly in June, rallied through uh, July and some parts of August. We hit the high over here in the middle of August, came on down, draw, uh, rallied up sharply, and now a sharp move to the downside. Now notice back in June, as the stock market went down, the green line went up. The green line is a combination of the short-term bond yields the six month to one year, the one year to the two year, et cetera. Now again, as bond prices go down, bond yields go up. This green line going up shows us traders are selling the bonds. The yields are going up. The spreads, the difference between those yields is also increasing. That's normal. That's what we would expect. As the stock market goes down again, take a look once again, History uh, certainly is replaying itself. The green line's going back up. Notice the blue line and the red line. The blue line is a culmination of the spreads between the long-term bonds, 30, 20 maturities, 20, 10-year maturities. That's going down. Traders buying the longer-term bonds. The red line's also going down. The red line are the medium-term bonds. That's the spreads between the 10 and the 7, the 7 and the 5 year, etc. So we're seeing that traders are dumping all the short term bonds and moving into longer term bonds as stocks go down. So to recap, we have a CPI higher than expected, showing a lot of inflation, not even in, in, fuel, in food and fuel, but more in medical services and a lot of other components that maybe a lot of uh, traders and analysts didn't expect. Well, that higher CPI number, those higher than expected inflation numbers are driving uh, traders to anticipate the Federal Reserve to raise interest rates even more aggressively than we thought last week. Later on this week, we have PPI, Producer Price Index. That has a very strong correlation to the CPI, today's number, 97%. If history is any judge, when the CPI goes up, the PPI goes up, this could give traders more excuses to sell stocks in anticipation of, again, higher inflation and a greater chance the Federal Reserve is going to raise interest rates uh, sooner rather than later and more than maybe we anticipated last month or even last week. So very interesting uh, phenomenon we're seeing in the data here uh, and we're going to certainly look very closely uh, in the days and weeks to come and we hope that you're, no, you're going to join us as well because we're going to have a lot to talk about in the near term future. We wish you a great day. And we'll look forward to seeing you back soon.